Statistics and Excel, bell curve test score data example. Got data? Let's get stuck into it with statistics and Excel. Although we'll be using OneNote this time, but we'll be talking about Excel. First, a word from our sponsor. Yeah, uh, actually we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But, but that's okay, whatever because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like our, trust me, I'm an accountant product line. Yeah, it's paramount that you let people know that you're an accountant because apparently we're among the only ones equipped with the number crunching skills to answer society's current deep, complex, and nuanced questions. If you would like a commercial free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. You're not required to, but if you have access to OneNote, we're in the icon left hand side, OneNote presentations, 1016 bell curve test score example tab. We're also uploading transcripts to OneNote so that you can go into the view tab, take a look at the immersive reader tool, change the language if you so choose, and then either read or listen to the transcript in multiple different languages tying into the video presentations with the timestamps. OneNote desktop version here. In prior presentations, we thought about how we can represent different data sets using both mathematical calculations, such as the average or mean mode, quartiles, median, and so on, and with pictorial representations, such as a box and whiskers or histogram. The histogram being the primary tool we use to envision the spread of the data, and we can use descriptive terms about the spread of the data on the histogram, such as the data is skewed to the left, the data is skewed to the right. We then thought about certain curves and lines that we might be able to represent using formulas that could give us an approximation of the actual data. Whenever we could do that, it would be a great thing to do because that gives us more predictive power generally into the future over whatever the data is representing because we have now a formula uh, for it. So some of those uh, curves and lines we've talked about in the past are a uniform distribution, binomial distribution, the Poisson distribution, the exponential distribution. Now we're looking at the most famous one of them all, the normal distribution or the bell curve. So the bell curve, like all of the other types of distributions, is, is only going to be useful in those cases when we're looking at certain types of data to, that conform to a distribution like a bell curve. So we have the same kind of process we might go through, such as looking at the data, testing it to see whether or not it looks like it conforms approximately to a bell curve. If it does, then we might be able to use an actual bell curve to give us that kind of predictive power over the data. Now, many things, of course, uh, do align to like a bell curve type of shape. The bell curve, I think one of the original ways that the bell curve came about was actually to test errors in approximations. So when they were trying to see things in the stars, for example, and see where a star is going to pop up or a planet's going to pop up or something like that, they would try to make mathematical representations about it. And of course, they would all be off, but they would have a tendency if you average them together to be off in a normal distribution around the correct answer, which is quite interesting. And it does give a lot of uh, weight to the idea of how you might structure certain types of things. So if you're trying to find something in the ocean or something like that, for example, instead of getting in a room and having everybody kind of come to an agreement, you might have everybody actually do their own calculations and, and then try to figure out where the thing is in the ocean. And then you put all those calculations together and average them. That might be a more, more uh, better way to find an answer in some cases. So it's kind of interesting, but a lot of things in nature also kind of conform to a bell curve. So whenever we're talking about heights of things, like humans or other or or animals or trees or things like that you would think that they would basically be conforming to a bell curve they most of them would be around the middle and they would have a bell curve distribution out you could do that for the for heights in general for heights of males and females you can do that for weights for example you can do that for uh for 
things like calorie intake, you would think that we would hover around some midpoint and go above and below that from time to time, but not too far because otherwise uh, we would get really big or really small, <laughs> uh, you would think. So there's many, many things where a bell curve might approximate the data. However, it does not always approximate any data set, which is sometimes a, a misconception that people have. They think that everything kind of should conform to the bell curve, and that's not necessarily the case. We've run into the same issues we saw with the prior curves. The data set could be doing anything. It could be doing something very chaotic, and we don't have any curve that can approximate the data. So, so what we want to do is determine if the data can be approximated. If it can, then apply it. Now, oftentimes, test scores, of course, might be something that conform to a bell curve because you have a similar kind of thing. If you have a bunch of people that are somewhere in the same area, the same grade or something like that, or they're in the same level of education, you would expect that the, the results that they have might conform somewhat to a bell curve uh, type of distribution. And that's, of course, also one of the most common examples both for instructors and students as they're always, always kind of analyzing the grades. So let's imagine we have this information for grades. Now note that in Excel, you could generate your own data in real life. We're imagining that the instructor has the data, has compiled the data, and is now looking at the data to see if it conforms to a bell curve. In practice, you might say, how could I get this data? Can I make up this data in some way? You can't really just use a random number generator because it's not gonna be completely random. It's gonna be in accordance to a bell curve kind of distribution. Uh, there's a tool in Excel that allows you to do that though. And it's in the, it's in the bar up top uh, under the data tab. So it's under data. And then you're looking in the analysis and it's data analysis. Now we turned this on when we worked this in Excel. So if you wanna work the Excel problem, you can check this out. If you don't have this analysis tab in Excel, then you can go into the options, the file tab and the options and turn on the data analysis, which again, we do in the Excel practice problem. But great tool to be able to practice with uh, these bell curves and some of the other distributions so that you can generate your own data that you can practice with, which is great. So in order to generate that data, we need to know the mean and the standard deviation. In real life, we might not know the mean or standard deviation. If we were the instructor, we would just be picking up the data and then running the analysis on that information. So here's our, our random generated test scores. Now note that the test scores, I purposely made them not in the format of a decimal or a percentage, but rather in the format of 90.97 uh, representing a 90%, right? So, and that makes it a little bit easier sometimes when we do the, the norm.dist uh, calculation. So in other words, if you're working with a data set that is represented in decimals or percentages, you might wanna multiply it times 100 so that you end up with a, a whole number representation because then uh, you'll have percentages when you do the norm.dis. So just to point that out, that's what we did here. So the 76.26 represents the 76% and so on and so forth. So here is all of our data. So then based on that data, we're imagining in, in our scenario that we're an instructor that has collected this data over multiple years or something like that. We can take the mean or average of that data and that would, of course, in Excel, be the trustee average function equals average of all of this data. We just sum up or take the average of it, and it comes out to 74.29. Now, you might say, why isn't the average exactly 75? Because I used 75 to generate the data in Excel. And that's because there's randomness involved in it. So it's going to come around something close to that midpoint of 75 but it's got the randomness, so it's not exactly 75, it's 74.92. And then the standard deviation, which would be the standard deviation here of the population is what we're using at this point in time, of these numbers gives us 10.09, which once again is not exactly the 10, which we had to use to generate the data because of that randomness involved in it. And then we have the median, the one in the middle, and that's the equals the median of this data. 
Now note that the mean and the median are pretty close together. That is one indication that this might conform to a normal distribution or bell curve. You also might calculate the mode, which is the number that, that has multiple times the same number comes up. And if that is also similar to the mean or median, it would be another indication that you're close. You might be, I have a bell curve distribution. Now, in this case, the mode might not work exactly because notice we're not representing the grades as just like a 72 or a, or a 90. We've got decimals. So the fact that we have decimals means it's a lot less likely that we're going to have multiple numbers that are exactly the same. However, if we did not have decimals, if we rounded this to the whole number, then it would be quite likely that the mode would be a useful tool and it would probably be similar to the mean, something like a 74. All right, and then we've got the, now, if I wanna plot this, the next thing we're gonna do is say, okay, it kinda looks like this data conforms to a bell curve due to the mean and the uh, median being the same. We could make a, a curve from it to further test that so we could so if i make a histogram of this data it looks like this now the histogram is where we have the buckets down below so this is going from 40 to 4363 and the middle point is in here remember the mean is like uh, 74 so this is going from 71 to 75 and so and so you can see it kind of looks somewhat like a bell curve notice that it's not going to be exactly like a bell curve because we don't have a whole lot of data i can't remember exactly how much uh how many data points we put here but the more data points the closer you would think that it would conform to a bell curve if you're using something that doesn't have as many data points you would expect it to be a little bit more jagged also it will be impacted by the bucket sizes that we're going to use down below which we talked about in prior presentations but we're saying hey look the the median the mode look like they're pretty close and uh and it looks like it's kind of conforming to a bell curve and we have an intuition that this data might conform to a bell curve so we might then want to graph this thing as a bell curve so we're going to choose the x's and we're going to choose the p of x's so we're going to then plot this thing out, plot our data points so that we can then create a chart from this information. So then the question are the X's. When I start my X's, I can think about this and say, well, look, this is grades. So I would think it would be going from zero uh, up to 100, 100 representing 100%, zero representing zero, one representing 1%. 1 so I could do it that way. I could just go from zero to 100. Uh, but I might want to, in, in other examples, I might say, I might not have that convenience. I might say, well, where, where should I start my beginning and ending X's when I want to plot my graph and then it's going to show up on the X axis? Well, we know that in a bell curve that the vast majority of the data will be within three or four. The vast, vast majority of the data will be in four standard deviations. So we could say, let's take four standard deviation both above and below, and that should be encompassing all of the data. So for example, the standard deviation is 10.09. If I take that times four, there's four standard deviations. If I'm starting at 74.92, the middle point minus that 74.92, then I can say that the lower X should be uh, should be 34. So I can really just go down to 34 and still be picking up all the data. I don't have to go down to zero, in other words, because it's unlikely that you're going to have test scores all the way down to zero. That would be quite badly performed test. People could guess and you'd probably do better than that. If I did this again, 10.09 times four and then go above the mean, four standard deviations above the mean, plus 74.92, then I get to 115. Now you might be saying 115 doesn't make any sense because it's over 100%. But, you know, in some cases you might have such like extra credit or something. But in the bell curve scenario, note that you can go on forever when you look at the theoretical concept of a bell curve. So, to, so it might be useful, even though in practice, it's not going to go over 100 to plot it out to 115 so I can see the entire bell curve 
tapering off as bell curves do. And then I can also see like the total adding up to 100%. Let me show you what I mean. We've got then the X's. So here's our X's going from 34 on down. And then we're gonna do our P of X calculation. To do this, we're gonna use the norm.dist function within Excel. So this is gonna give, this is gonna be kind of similar to some of the, the Poisson distribution, for example, or binomial distribution we talked about in the past, but now we got the norm.dist. The X is gonna be 34 in this case, representing that grade. And then, so what's the, what's the likelihood of getting a 34 if we're talking about the bell curve with the mean and standard deviation defined over here? So the mean is gonna be the 74, and then comma, the standard deviation is gonna be the 10.09. And then is it cumulative or not? This cumulative is similar to what we saw with the Poisson distribution, for example. Although uh, here we're, we're representing the area under the curve. So, so, it's, it's, so it's a little bit different in terms of kind of like calculus involved the area under the curve, but the concept is basically the same. Do we want the cumulative up to that point or do we want just that point? In this case, we want just that point. So it's false or zero, and then we get to around 0%. So if we take this down, we're gonna say, okay, what's the likelihood of getting a 46? We're gonna say 0.07%, right? So that's the questions that we might ask with this. Now, most of the time, if you're a student, for example, you're probably gonna be asking, what's the likelihood that I get like a 70 or above that kind of question? which you might say, well, I can go down to 70 down here and then add up everything from 70 on up. But you can't usually do that exactly because again, although you might have been able to do that with a Poisson distribution here, we're talking about the area under the curve that might give you an approximation, but you'd wanna use a formula with a cumulative formula, which we'll talk about a little bit in a little bit here. But there's our P of X. So that'll give us our, our approximated curve. So if I was to look at it, then it would, it would look something like this. Here's our approximated, uh, our, our actual curve that approximates the actual data. And this is the blue representing the, the curve and the orange representing our actual data. So now we're plotting the data on top and you can see it kind of lines up. I'll show you how we did that in a second here. So then just to note uh, here, we can say the frequency. Now I might want to compare my P of X information to my actual data. And I have a problem with that because my actual data over here is being represented is actually outputs my whole, my whole numbers over here. And my P of X is in, uh, is in the likelihood of something ha of, a, of a 34. So, what I could do is, is, is try to convert my P of X into, into uh, a number by multiplying times the number of, 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 uh, of samples that we have, or we can try to take our actual data and make it into a percent, which is probably the more common thing. So what I wanna do to compare my actual data is I wanna look at my actual data over here. So there's my actual data. I want to I want to count how many times each of these data fall into the buckets. Now note that the these numbers aren't exact because I'm looking at for example on this 35 how much how many data sets in our actual data are within or above set 34 up to and including 35 and then how many items in the data set count them if they're above 35 up to and including 36. That's going to be our frequency calculation, which looks like this frequency, the data array, which just be highlighting all of our data saying that's what I want you to count, basically. And then the bin array being all this information, which are the bins that we want you to put those counts into. So if we said this, we, how many times did you count 34? How many times did you count above 34 up to and including 35 zero scrolling down? We're going to say how many times did you count up to and including or over 40 up to and including 41 two two times that that happened in our actual data how many times did you go 
above 50 up to and including 51 how many of those were in our data set three of them and so on and so forth and if we go all the way down we could see the data if i add up all of that data it adds up to a thousand that should be the actual number of grades in our sample data that's how many sample data points that we generated that's a nice check number that we have to make sure that we picked all of them up and put them in an appropriate bucket now what the problem here is that i can't compare that 10 to what I got in my norm.dist because the norm.dist is 0.79. I could multiply the 0.79 times the 1,000 sample, right? I could say, well, I had a sample of 1,000. I would predict based on the norm.dist times 0.79 that it would be 1,000, 1,000 times 0 0.0079 would be 7.9, right? I could do it that way. I can multiply all these times a thousand to compare it to these actual counts, or I can take my actual counts and divide it by the total, which is what we'll do here. So now I'm going to say, all right, let's take like this. If I take this 14 and divide it by a thousand, 14 divided by a thousand, then I get, if I move the decimal two places over 1.4. Now that 1.4 is in a percentage format so I can now compare it to this percentage format. So I'm just doing that all the way down. So this 19 is 19 divided by the count of 1,000. So move the decimal two places over 1.9%, which is pretty close to the 1.97 that we got with the norm.dist uh, function. So then I can compare these. I can look at the differences. This is what I got with the function. This is my actual percent uh, data of the total. And you can see we're pretty close on the data. So that would that would give us what well, you know, it's somewhat close. That would give us another indication that or how far away from a normal distribution uh, we are. And then here we got the z-score. Now the z-score is another way to represent our data. And it's trying to say, I'm going to represent the data in terms of how close it is to the middle point, which is the mean of our normal distribution. So if I look at my, my information over here, the middle point on our graph is going to be 74.92, standard deviation 10.09. So what I, what I could do is start to say, well, if I look at my graph and I say, well, this is, you know, this is the middle point. I could start to measure how far away above and below that middle point the normal is. How far away are you from the normal would be the z-score, right? The, the lower the z-score, the closer to zero the z-score, then the closer you are to normal with the mean. The further away you are uh, in a positive sense, the higher you are from the, z, from the middle and on a negative, the lower you are. So over here, how do we calculate that? we're going to say that that we're going to take each point in this case 34 34 minus the mean which was uh 74 minus this number 74.92 and then i divide that by the standard deviation the standard deviation so divided by the 10.09 and that gives us our in this case negative 4.06 so that's going to be our z-score and i can look at all these and, and each of these data points then remember oftentimes when we're looking at comparing something like job performance or performance in schools sports performances and stuff then we have to represent things in percentages a, a percentage we don't we don't we're not saying uh, how many how many we got correct or incorrect we're taking a percent of the total which is even more useful if you if you're talking about things that are uneven like batting averages or job performance because you had a different number of tries at something that's why the percent is a useful tool in and of itself to make more comparability uh, and then we can also compare kind of with the z-score which is going to give us our how close we are to that middle point or middle when we're talking about a normal or bell curve distribution represents what's normal the average 
what what normal people do. So notice that the bell curve is kind of interesting too, because before that, you got to think that people might not have had as tuned a sense as to what normal is. Like the bell curve almost seems like it kind of defined normal. So people that are too tall used to be used to be thought of as kind of weird. Now they're kind of idolized for being very tall. <laughs> and that's always been the case, I guess, to some degree. But too tall, you'd be saying that's abnormal. Abnormal was bad. Well, how do you know it's abnormal? Because we have a bell curve and it's showing on these types of things. And too small is abnormal. So now it's weird. It's outside the it's outside the range. So you got to think before the bell curve, did people really think in terms of how abnormal something is or something like that. But in any case, the middle point is around 74. So you can see that Z score is around zero. And then the Zs are positive going above it uh, from that point. Okay, so that's the Z score. So we have those questions. So now we can kind of ask questions uh, such as we can we could say, okay, well, uh, what if a test score is equal to uh, 90 and the operator is less than or equal to? So if we had something like this, P of X is less than or equal to uh, the 90, how would we get you know that calculation? Because remember, if I look over here, we're going to say, okay, well, 90, if I go down to 90, I can see that the likelihood of me getting 90 would be 1.92. But that's not usually what I want. I want usually greater than or equal to 90 or less than or equal to 90 possibly. But either way, if it was greater, if I, what's the likelihood I get above 90? I could, you'd think, well, I could add these up. I can add all this up down to here. But again, you can't do that exactly. That'll give you an approximation because we're talking about the area under the curve. So you could do that. It'll give you an approximation but it's not going to be exact to get a, an exact number. This is less than, so this would be the, the likelihood of something less than or equal to 90, would be equal to norm dot dist. The X is going to be up top the mean, 74.92, standard deviation, 10.09, and then the, the X is 90, and, the cumul and then the cumulative bit, do we want it to be cumulative? We do. So that means it's going to add everything up, which gives us the likelihood of 93.24. This isn't the test score that we're looking at the likelihood that we have something at a 90 or below. The likelihood of getting a 90 or below based on the bell curve is 93.24%. In other words, we would expect 93.24% of participants uh, to score 90 or less on the test. And then if I looked at the Z-score, I could say, okay, well, what about the Z-score then? Where do they line up with the Z-score? Well, we've got 90 minus the mean, which is 74.92, which is 15 divided by the standard deviation, 10.09. And that gives us a Z-score of 1.49. Remember that zero is normal. Zero would be at the 74. So, so remember that normally you would think with test, well, average should be 70, right? Wasn't that like, but, but, but then you got to think about, well, what are averages on this particular test, right? In this, in this case, the average score, the middle point is 74, around 75. So if you get a 90, so 74, 75 would be zero in terms of Z scores. If you get a 90, you're clearly well above that. And so we're at the 1.49 in terms of z-scores. And then if we look at this one, uh, we can calculate this same thing, the probability of x being below or equal to 90, not with x this time, but with z-scores. So the z-scores is kind of like another, is another way that we can, rep we can represent things by x or the z-score, right? And if I do it with a z-score, the formula would just be equals norm.s.dis. And there's only two things we need to do, the Z and cumulative. We only need the Z because notice that the Z score itself calculated and included the X, the mean, and the standard deviation. So all we need is the, is the Z and then one for cumulative to get to that same answer if we had the Z score instead of X and we wanted the likelihood of getting 
uh, less than or equal to the 90. So then if we, if we want a question like greater than or equal to 90, then it would be a similar thing over here. We can say, okay, well, if I go over here, now I'm looking at 90, which has a 1.29% likelihood, and then you would sum everything up down to here. But that will not be exact, but you can do that as an approximation. To be more exact, we can use a formula. Uh, one, you could do it this way. You could say, well, if to get less than 90 is that, so I can say 100% minus 93.24 gives us 6.76. In other words, if I'm going to have less than or equal to, or greater than or equal to 90 is 93%, and it has to add up to 100, then then the likelihood of the other side, uh, greater than or equal to 90 is, is only the 6.76%. Or you can do it with our calculation. So now we have to say it's the same thing, norm.dist, but now we're taking one representing 100% minus the norm.dist of the x 90%, the mean that we saw up top, same standard deviation, and we want it to be cumulative. So that's doing the same thing we did up here, one minus the answer we got before. We're just doing it in one cell now, one or 100% minus the answer we got before. And then we can do the z-score, same thing. So we have our z-score, same z, but now we're asking getting over the 90 or that z-score, same concept, one minus uh, what we got, the norm.s.dist. So we, we can do the same thing, just like we did up top with either x's or z's, whatever the case may be. And then we could say, what if we're doing in between? So the next question you would ask is, well, what if I, what's my likelihood of getting somewhere between a 75 and what did I say, a 90? I can live, I can live with that. I won't die. At least I won't die if I do that. I probably won't die if I get below that anyways, but I might, there's a chance that it'll kill me. So you could sum those up, but again, it won't be exact because because uh, it's the area. So we can be more exact like this. We can write this a couple different ways. P of X, I like is, 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 so now you have X is greater than or equal to 70 and less than or equal to 80. I kind of like writing it this way, which is probably not the most efficient way because I like to have the X on the left. So X is greater than or equal to 75 and less than or equal to the 90. But in any case, the formula would look like this. It's a bit uglier because we have to use that cumulative thing as we saw in the Poisson distributions. We want to take the cumulative on the high side. So if I look at my picture over here and the pictures are nice to use, we're going to show how to make these in Excel. So if I'm, if I'm trying to find, uh, you know, the, the, if I'm trying to find like this side, then I could take the whole thing. I could take the whole thing minus. So if I'm trying to find the blue area, I could take the whole thing minus the cumulative minus the orange area will give us the, the blue area, 100% minus the orange area. If I'm trying to find something in the middle, then I can take the cumulative up to the top point and then take the cumulative up to would be, would be the bottom point and you would be left with the middle, right? And so that's what we would do here. So, so that's what this formula is doing. Norm.dist of the higher X, the 90, the mean standard deviation, it needs to be cumulative. That's what the one is. Minus the norm.dist of the lower bit, the 75, will give us the bit in the middle 42.93%. Remembering this does not mean that we're talking about you're going to get a 43% on the test. It means you have a, f the, of all the people taking the tests, we expect around 43% to have scores between 75 and 90. So, or equal to including 75 and 90. We could do that with the Z scores as well. So if I was to calculate the 75 Z score, so I can say, I can say, okay, what are we doing with the Z scores? The Z score, if I'm talking uh, the 75, 75 minus the minus the 74, minus 74.94, that's the distance from the middle point divided by the standard deviation, 10.09 10 is going to give us that, uh, that point uh, 00. 
It didn't. It didn't work. It's seventy-five. I think I said seventy. Seventy-five minus seventy-four point nine two divided by ten point oh nine gives us that uh, around point oh oh eight. If I move the decimal two places over, and this z-score is ninety minus the seventy-four point nine two divided by the standard deviation of 10.09, and that gives us the 1.494. So I can do the same concept, but instead of using Xs, now using the Zs, which would be norm.s.dist, then all I need is the Z because I already have kind of the X, uh, I'm sorry, the mean and the standard deviation, the X, the mean, the standard, are all compacted into that Z, cumulative that's for the higher bit the 1.494 minus the norm.s.dist for the lower uh, z and that'll give us the same 42.93 the part in the middle so there's our there's our z's and we can actually plot this over here so if we want to make our graph notice that i made these with bar graphs and this is an actual area graph now so we did this with the area and then the question is, well, how can I draw these graphs, which is quite useful, especially if you're like me and you're really not good at drawing these graphs. This kind of really hold, held me back learning math in school because I would get all messed up on how many numbers should be on the X and the Y. And, then, and so uh, if you can make these in Excel, then it's great. But it's still a little bit complicated to do. So, this, so we do this in Excel so you can, you can uh, plot this out we're doing this with an if logical test so if uh we're saying that if this x here if this x is uh greater so we're right here we're looking for less than or equal to 90 uh x is greater than or equal to 90. so we're taking this x and we're saying if it is less than or equal to uh, I believe the 90 is what we're picking up in our formula over here. And we'll do this. I highly recommend taking a look at it in Excel if you're uh, interested in this. There's the 90. And then we're saying that uh, if that is true, then we want you to give me the result, which is this P of X. And if it's not true, we want you to just give me a blank cell which is represented by the double quotes because whenever you have text it's with the quotes so you can see it's got stuff in it up to here which stops at the 90 and now you have blank stuff so if i graph this on top of my other chart here then that's where that's where we get this line which gives us that that nice representation so we can try to understand a little bit more pictorially what is happening notice that this graph is really pretty neat as well in that we also put the x's here as well as the z scores down here so now we can look at two uh, x axes because remember that we talked about the idea that we can represent a lot of this stuff in terms of talking about it in x's uh which are the grades right and talking about it in the z scores which is the distance from that middle point so we can actually put two of these in here which is a little fancy tricky thing to do in excel so you want to check that out in Excel so you can you can utilize that tool as well. Also note that you might be able to get away with like one of these graphs because remember there's that le there's basically three questions we ask oftentimes. There's more than three, but one, one of the common ones would be what is above? So we asked what is everything above a certain point like the 90? So that would be the area of the blue side. And then we ask, well, what's everything below a certain thing? And notice that if, if you use one graph, you can kind of ask both those questions. Because if I'm asking what is above a certain point, that's the blue side, that also means that because it adds up to 100%, the orange represents the question of what if something is summed up up to and including everything below a certain point. And then the next question often asked is the one that's in the middle. And that's the one you can't, you might have to do a little bit more fancy graph. So we have a whole bunch of different ways that we can make these graphs that we'll, we'll demonstrate uh, in Excel and try to explain them a little bit here in the OneNotes. Also note with this graph, we, when we graphed this, this is the actual bell curve in a bar chart in our actual data. This is the, this is the bell curve in the actual data 
And when we graph those, we graph this one on top of the uh, percent of total column to get this one. So those are the, that's the general idea. Again, I highly recommend checking this stuff out uh, in Excel.